one of the things that we didn't know as much about is on the fishery side, or at least I'm certainly not nearly as educated on it. And, you know, coming up here fishing this river and these fish, and it's like, I feel like we should know the story of these fish better. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and yeah. Well, the story of the fish is really the story of the river. Yeah. You know, these fish are anadromous. Um, they, uh, they spend uh, varying parts of their lives lengths of their lives in the river but they spend most of their time out at sea Mm -hmm. but the most important part of their life cycle you know spawning um and rearing yeah um, being born and you know the beginning and the end of their life cycles here in the river and um the trinity river as a major tributary to the klamath has been uh you know um a, a, a really hot uh um well has supported numerous anadromous fish runs incredibly yeah. dense productive runs yeah um over the millennia and uh you know our um native american neighbors just down river i mean they're salmon people the the hoopa the yurok um the uh up here was the wind too in this area um the karuk on the klamath um they're you know they uh variously consider themselves salmon people and and um you know, for since time immemorial, they've been here because of the fish. Yeah. So, you know, we, uh, from an anthropological, you know, perspective, um, salmon are, and steelhead are important. Um, and we have that record through those, um, through the Native Americans, you know, that, that's why they're, that's why they're here. <laughs> it's because of the salmon. Um, and, uh, but the river, you know, it, um, it, 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 it it's been abuse, you know, mm. to put it. Uh, mildly, uh, beginning with the gold rush, and you know we we don't have um, we don't have uh, a lot of pre disturbance information about you know uh, quantitative information about the Trinity River, right? Um, because the miners got here in the mid eighteen fifties, yeah. Before you know, there people were really paying attention to they weren't the collecting baseline data. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so it's it's hard you know other than the um, the um, stories that we hear that have been passed down from generations, you know, in the uh, Native Americans, it's it's tough to visualize what the river was like. Except we know that it supported just tremendous runs of fish. We know that. Otherwise, we, it wouldn't have supported all the humans that were out here. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but um, immediately after the miners got here, they, you know, did, did their... Uh, hydraulic mining mm-hmm. and, and dredging and i'm sure you saw and you guys have seen all the dredge tailings all around yeah. the river down especially, in city especially you know, yeah like, yeah, just yeah huge pile, huge piles and a lot of those um uh that sediment was washed down from surrounding hillsides there there are ancient rivers in here and a lot of times they were actually mining those ancient river beds so you'll be up mm-hmm. on a mountain or hill well yeah no mountain um wet you know hundreds and hundreds of feet above the river and there will be river rocks up there from some ancient river mm-hmm. that was uplifted and ended up there and a lot of those miners were mining those um, ancient deposits in the um in the uh, sediments way up high um and that ended up in the river aggraded the river bottom mm-hmm. um what was that word they used aggraded yeah. So yeah, aggradation just uh, yeah deposited on the river. Yeah, in in places um, the Douglas City area uh, estimates are that the valley bottom um, uh, increased by about ten feet, and it's about twenty down there by Junction City. Wow. Which Makes Junction sense. City, the Lagrange mine, was the largest hydraulic mine in the world at, at that time and maybe forever, as is, far as we know. Is that the one where you're going down to 99 just on the left side yeah. that's like still sort yeah. of active, right? Yeah, well now it's uh, like a gravel quarry. Gravel they're, quarry. Yeah, they're, uh, they're mining rock there for road construction. Okay. And, they're, and they're generally working the, you know, the tailings from that old hydraulic mine. So it doesn't really represent a new you know, impact. Mm-hmm. If anything, it's, it's probably benefits <laughs> to the, to the environment, up. cleaning it up, yeah. So that 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 mining history really kind of set the stage for where we are right now. So I w- I'm I'm curious what your sense of the population has been like since then, right? So like it might be yeah. hard to know before the mining, but there that created this kind of baseline situation that we're right. kind of dealing with today. Yeah. And so like where are we at with the populations now as opposed to like maybe 
you know, the mid 20th century versus. The yeah. Mid- still probably le- quite a bit less. Uh, okay. you know, um, when they were mining back in those days, the river was so muddy. The, the miners didn't know there were fish in the river. And then <laughs> during world war two, they shut down all gold mining, um, mm. yeah, for economic re- or, well, they, they, I think they wanted extractive industries to go towards copper and lead and steel mm-hmm. rather than gold. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they shut down mining and the river started running clear. And there were reports that there were uh, huge numbers of salmon and steelhead back in the 40s. Wow, they, weren't, they weren't fishing at all the miners. You'd think it would be a good resource for them if they're yeah. out there. Yeah, well, they were fi- they, I say they didn't know. Yeah. They they, they, but uh, it, the water was so muddy, and I'm sure the fish, when they were hitting those mined areas, were running right through. Yeah. Yeah. There were there was uh, reports uh, in the 18, maybe 60s or 70s of a uh, fish wheel in the Douglas City area, a mm-hmm. fish trap, like a water wheel oh, that wow. migrating salmon would hit and then wow. they would scoop them up and deposit them in a trap so <laughs> there was some of that and, they, and that was to sell to the miners oh, um, so there was some of that going on so I may have yeah, yeah. maybe a little hyperbole but, but it was not uh, bad of a state it wasn't considered a, you know yeah. that important of a resource until World War II and water started to run clear and um, Bing Crosby fished out you oh, know wow. out here he, he fished uh, stayed at the Indian uh, Creek Lodge, um, just uh, in the, you know, near you guys drove past it on the way. And, yeah, right there. Um, they, there used to be a hole named after him. Of course, the river's changed, uh, so I don't. I know the general area, but I don't think it's really a hole anymore. <laughs> Bean Crosby Hole. Yeah. Anyway, they, they it became a destination for steelheaders, but there were a lot of salmon as well. Um, when the when the river cleared up, um, mm-hmm. but then not long after. Um, in the late fifties, uh, they decided to put a dam, you know, in the in the Trinity, <laughs> and it became a really important part of the Central Valley project. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it water from uh, the Trinity River is uh, diverted at Lewiston uh, underground through a tunnel to Whiskey Town Lake. Uh, you can see the penstocks coming into the car powerhouse uh, right at Whiskey Town Lake. It's mm-hmm. it when you're driving through, it doesn't make sense that they would be there that you know you wouldn't think that that water's coming from the trinity but it is Mm. and uh and then that um goes on through another pipe to keswick lake where it's released into the sacramento river and uh power's made multiple times but that water ends up in the delta where it's pumped and it and a lot of it goes to uh uh, irrigation in the san joaquin valley Mm. um the whole water system is plumb so the water from the trinity that would have been destined to the, go to the ocean um in del norte county at, at uh the mouth of the klamath um it it could end up down in san diego <laughs> wow. so i mean that the, the uh, huge um water infrastructure that the trinity is trapped into and a big demand for that water both for uh irrigation as well as power generation and and municipal uses as well and um so that that dam, it's uh, a, a huge part of California's economy and our, our way of life. But it did two things that, well, it did a lot of things, but two things I, that I know a lot about. It blocked the uh, migration of anadromous fish into um, headwaters and, and uh, you know, streams that are fed by the Trinity Alps. Mm-hmm. Stewart's Fork, Coffee Creek, all of those right. would have been... Right, exactly. Those yeah. would have been spawning and rearing areas for... Um, Spring Chinook, Fall Chinook, Coho, and Steelhead. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of a lot of different fish would have been using all that. So, um, cut off that migration, and um, and then it, it it stopped the floods and the supply of sediment um, to the river. And uh, we used to have huge floods in this area. Um, there's a gauge at the old Lewiston Bridge in Lewiston hmm. that, that was installed in 1911, oh, and wow. we have a whole record. 50 years or so before the dam was filled, and the flood record there was 70,000 cubic feet per second. <laughs> right now, the river you guys were fishing in is probably about 400 where you were fishing. <laughs> and, uh, uh, was that the big one in the 60s? Or? That was 1955. Okay, 55, yeah. 64 okay. was a big the flood, big one, but yeah. not, not in this area because uh, Trinity Dam was able built. to hold all that runoff. And wow. they only released 300 cubic or so. A very, very minor flow all winter. I think it was 300 wow. um, all during that whole flood. And, of course, there's accretion downriver, so by the time you got to... Um, 
the Willow Creek and, and uh, Hoopa area, it was huge. But up here, it was it wasn't was wasn't really a flood. The main stem was not a flood, but um, but the tributaries did flood in that 1964 event, and and unleashed a lot of sediment still coming down from the mountains from the mining area. Plus, these are highly erodible mountains in the first place. You know, mm. they're um, they're young and they're always eroding. So those tributaries introduced a lot of sediment into the river and the floodplains mm. that the main stem was unable to export, oh, to send can... through. Oh, and that contributed further to that aggradation that I was talking about earlier, which uh, in a lot of places led to a downcut channel that's very simplified and confined and is uh, disconnected from the floodplain. Mm. And floodplains are areas where fish rear. They're very important. And... Um, one of the things that the Trinity River Restoration Program is doing is addressing that by uh, through our channel re rehabilitation projects and doing a lot of excavation to reconnect the river with the floodplain. Um, and you probably saw some of the sites. You may not have noticed or seen them, but um, but you were definitely fishing in the in the area of uh, some of our restoration sites today. Okay. The Signer Flat. Uh, primitive campground was actually one. There was one right there. Yeah, we noticed there was like a side channel there that like yeah. at the bend. Right. That also kind of cut yeah. in. Yeah, that was constructed in oh, interesting. 2000, right. yeah. 2013 is when that was done. Okay. And then right below, I don't know if you saw Lorenz Gulch, that was a 2014 project. But the river that. access just downstream of the uh, primitive campground. Um, but uh, our channel rehabilitation projects address a lot of that that yeah. condition where we have a lot of sediment in the valley that's a result of both the mining and the um, and the 1964 flood, um, and then the dams don't allow those floods that used to mm -hmm. happen that would have um, you know healed the river if they were there channelized it yeah yeah so we do have some we do we do have floods on the managed floods on the Trinity. Just the scale is just nowhere near what they used right. to be. So that 55 flood, um, that was a, over a 50-year period of time. You know, we had a gauge there. and we So we know that it was a 70,000 CFS event. But you can imagine on a one- or 200-year time scale, there must have been even bigger floods then. Totally. Well, the biggest contemporary flood was 1974, and that was a 14,000 CFS event. And since then, we ha we've had a, a few 12,000 CFS floods, but uh, basically an order of magnitude less than a 50-year flood that we had before the dam. So, And those floods were all managed by the dam, so it was like purposefully, you know, someone well, letting water out? or was The it 1974 flood was a safety a dam, or no, sorry, it wasn't a safety, it was a glory hole spill. So Trinity Lake filled up. Mm. The lake was young, you know, and they were. I think they were fine-tuning the hydrology <laughs> the, or the operation of the dam based on what they were learning about the hydrology. But, but the dam or the lake actually filled up so much. There's a glory hole just above the dam. Yeah. That was an uncontrolled release, but it is buffered by Lewiston Lake. It um, basically you know, it goes over buffer. the top. Yeah. It does. It didn't go over the top, but because it's an earth filled dam, if that was to ever happen and wash the whole <laughs> thing, uh, but there's a, it's a like glory little, hole. It's, the, it's like a, the plug in the sink, right? Like the sink. Yeah, if it yeah, goes exactly. up too much. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's just a big top drain. Yeah, I yeah. guess you call it. So the very top of the reservoir, yeah. and 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 that provides a, a lot of buffering too. I mean, I don't know what the inflow into the lake was, but because you have such a huge surface area mm -hmm. of the lake, it, it comes up a few inches, and you know, and it starts, you know pouring into the glory hole a few just a few feet it takes a while for yeah. for the whole totally. service to respond so that buffers floods but um but after that um in uh 2000 the uh, trinity river main stem fishery environmental impact statement was uh adopted by the department of the interior and the hoopa valley tribe um that was adopted in a record of decision they call it the trinity rod and um, that had provisions for uh, saving water to release into the river hmm. um, in, in, a, in a managed way. And, and so before the rod, um, you know, up to 90% of the inflow into Trinity Lake was exported to the uh, Central Valley. 90. 90%, yeah. Wow. And 10% on average. Or, well, I shouldn't, I'm not sure if it was an average, but up to 90% 
was exported and as little as 10% was on an annual basis was released to the river. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, since 2000, it's more balanced. So half is exported and half goes to the river. And pre-rod uh, um, flows were generally very low year round, um, 300 to 450. Mm-hmm. Uh, and before the early 80s, it was even less than that. Uh, but but after the rod, we um, have a spring release that mimics a snowmelt flood. Mm. Um, and um, the winter, um, we're working on winter flow. There's constraints, legal and political constraints, to having free reign over managing water on a strictly scientific basis. But um, but at least in the spring, we can mimic a snowmelt release and release water, depending on what the water year um is mm-hmm. if it's a critically dry dry normal extremely wet or wet uh we'll have a certain volume of water to release into the river in, in the spring and um that that's intended to accomplish both um, biological effects as well as geomorphic effects move sediment cause scour and inundation would you mind just talking about the organization that you're with and um like how it originated uh how it's funded like yeah well um it, 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 this organization is called the Trinity River Restoration Program, and it was essentially founded through that record of decision. Okay. Um, and, and that was born of um, decades of people recognizing that the fishery declined after the dams were, mm-hmm. um, were uh, constructed yeah, exactly. and, and a need to restore the, the fishery. So, um, so uh, it, the record of decision established the program and um, it's a multi-agency partnership. Um, the partners are uh, the um, Department of Interior, which is represented by both the Bureau of Reclamation and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Mm-hmm. Uh, the California um, Resources Agency, which is represented by the, both the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Department of Water Resources. Um, the Hoopa Valley Tribe, the Yurok Tribe, um, the Forest Service and uh, Trinity County, and uh, also <laughs> the National um, Marine Fishery Service. So uh, a lot of um, the groups to get together. Group, to yeah, there's representatives from each one of these groups yeah. that compose the uh, Trinity Management Council, mm-hmm. which is like a board of directors for the program. Mm-hmm. They uh, make a they, they delegate a lot of decisions to um, either the program office or different partners. But ultimately, they're responsible for um, implementing restoration on the Trinity River. Wow. And yeah, they're generally funded by um, the uh, Bureau of Reclamation mm-hmm. um, and, and also the Fish and Wildlife Service. Department um, of Interior. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's uh, we, so I, we occasionally get grants from other agencies, um, yeah. like the state of California at times. Um, sometimes there's uh, mitigation that, they need to accomplish and so they'll give us the money to do that but mm-hmm. our base funding is all from the department of, of the interior cool. and and most of that comes from water and power user fees from mm-hmm. the water essentially the water that's being diverted it 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 results in a lot of uh, income right. and and the, oh, that that a, a portion of that income goes back to the river and the resource that uh, so it's a little mitigation um, yeah, sure. uh, circle sure. is it true that electricity around here is like very very reasonably priced or even very cheap yeah it's about that? nine cents a kilowatt hour which is uh maybe from what i can tell p like pg e is the major companion you know, well that's the alternative well not really an alternative but if you weren't on uh, trinity public utilities district power you'd be taking it from PG and E, and I believe they are somewhere around two or three times higher than wow. T Pud rate, and that's a that's a part of the was part of the legislation that authorized the dam sort of a deal that Congress made with the local residents yeah. for <laughs> for um, you know taking the water. So yeah, and and most uh, people around here are, are pretty grateful for that. I'm sure, I'm yeah, sure, cheap yeah. power. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. so what's that like to be on like a management council with so many different interests, I assume, or different perspectives? On, yeah. Like, is, is, uh, what, well, it can be like? really difficult at yeah. times. Um, it, it, uh, it, 
but at the same time, um, I mean, are there different interests or, sure. or is everyone kind of on the same board with respect to the intention of the program? You know, everybody's, everybody on the council wants to see it restored. Yeah. Uh, uh, wants to see the Trinity Rivers form and function uh, restored and wants to see more anadromous fish mm -hmm. and, and wants to uh, see it supports the full participation of uh, dependent fisheries on those on those fish. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody's on the same page with regards to that, but there's always, um, not always, but there's oftentimes disagreements on actually on how to do that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and uh, the, the Trinity Management Council um, requires, well, they, they're a, a, a board, a governing board that makes decisions um, largely on how to spend money, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of where the rubber hits the road is how, how, how money is spent mm -hmm. and and that is um uh reflective of the policy of the board as well so they yeah. make policy decisions they make uh and they make uh, funding decisions and it, it they there's uh eight members they're all representatives of those agencies that i mentioned and um they uh requires seven for in order for a motion to pass there can only be one dissenting vote. Oh, wow. So there needs to be near near complete consensus for anything to proceed. Right. So uh, yeah, it's it, it can be difficult. Okay. It really can. back to the river we were wondering to ourselves about this phrase adaptive management because uh -huh. we like see it around a lot yeah. but we're just like what is adaptive management right yeah is that is that like a kind of well firstly like we're just curious like what does that mean to well that's a really like, good question uh, um, <laughs> program like the training river restoration program yeah, that's a and really like, good question yeah yeah is that so, part of what y'all do yeah, it sure is yeah and, and and it's uh i mean we mo we most of this of the decisions that we make are made in an adaptive management context, mm -hmm. and the research that we do, the science that's done, is done to support that decision making. Um, but um, adaptive management is uh, is in a way it's it's almost too it's almost oversim it is oversimplified to say it, but I, you can think of it as learning by doing. It's yeah. not trial and error. You know, it's it's it, there's a structured approach. That uses science and hypothesis testing, mm -hmm. uh, but um, it's probably better explained um, as uh, um, with an example, right? Totally. So, yeah. Um, so uh, if if uh, if you were uh, interested, if you have a hypothesis based on observations that you made and and the literature, uh, the scientific literature that say. Um, uh, adjusting, changing the water temperature would have a beneficial effect on fish. You You've would see these that. little signs in the river that someone's studying. Yeah. The water <laughs> oh, you did. Okay. Yeah. Right. We saw them in that. September. Yeah. That's um, something that's going on right now. Someone yeah. with, with the TR with the training. Yes. Yes. Right? What's, uh, what's his name? I, I Todd saw Bucks. Yeah. Todd. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Doing uh, um, uh, uh, looking at how um, pools stratify that thermally stratify um, at certain flows. And and the importance there is that in a river, certain species and life stages use different temperatures. Um, I mean, most, well, not fish are, fish are uh, uh, you know, they're cold blooded, so they're, and, and growth is a temperature dependent uh, process. Mm -hmm. So they, they look for the right water temperature uh, to live and grow and same thing with uh, foothill yellow-legged frogs and now they're a native species as well special status they have two very different um, temperature requirements uh, oh, well. salmonids you know they generally want cold water and mm -hmm. frogs um, need warm water so and if they that, were on the board it would be it would be difficult because they would each want different things from the flows yeah right yeah yeah <laughs> so so we're look so when but 
but na rivers naturally aren't homogenous temperature, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, either not um, uh, temporally, like through the year, the temperature changes a lot, and also spatially, especially in the summer. Mm -hmm. You know, you have areas of cold water uh, and areas of warm water in the same river that would meet the needs of a lot of different species. But that's that's a uh, something that we're um, we're really looking into. So then get back to it. If um, if you were if you had a way to manage the temperature, you might set up an experiment based on you know a, 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 not just a, a initial hypothesis, but something that was pretty well founded in you know your um, knowledge of the of the uh, species needs mm -hmm. and um, um, what based that's based on what the literature says. Maybe some pilot experiments, but you actually manage the river differently for a period of time based on that and and manage those temperatures and then observe the effects on fish growth if that's what you think would change yeah and and then you use that information to uh, fine-tune iterate yeah we do it it's iteratively yeah, yeah. it's done yeah done uh, over several times that's and you start to get a picture so what adapt the thing about adaptive management is you don't have to have perfect knowledge of something before you get started you can mm -hmm. learn as you go but it's not it's different than trial and error which would be like well that didn't work well let's try this you know <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's it's uh, hypothesis testing is a central part of that um, decision so and you start with first principles about what you know about yes the species. right so yeah. can we just make this super real for a sec with the salmon like sure. what yeah. is the temperature like what? What actual temperature gradients or thermal changes are y'all interested in looking at? Right yeah. Now? Like, and how is that related to like changes in the flow? Okay. Yeah. Um, is that? Yeah. Is no, that a fair no. question. Yeah. Know. That's that's uh, so. If you think about a Mediterranean, a river in a Mediterranean climate, yeah. and what it means to fish. Well, I'll start with the winter because, you know, they're cold. They're fairly cold in the winter because the the, the air temperature is cold and the mm -hmm. days are short. Yeah. And all that. So we all know that. Um, and, and they're generally pretty high, depending on if storms are coming through. Um, and then throughout the spring, you may or may not have a snowmelt um, runoff. Generally in, in this area, we, we would mm -hmm. historically from the Trinity Alps. And the water would be, you know, fairly cold and high during snowmelt. Um, and and uh, fish are in the river at that time. Um, they w would have spawned um, earlier, you know, in the late fall. Well, depending on the species, you know, Chinook um, are fall spawners, steelhead more winter, spring. Um, and uh, anyway, by the time um, late winter, early spring rolls around, most of those fry are, uh, have, are out of the gravel and they're feeding. And the river is dropping, mm -hmm. um, and the days are getting longer, and the water is warming up, and the fish are um, are responding to that by growing, and and uh, the um, warming of the water and the and the reduction in flow are cues to fish to do something to oh, move to to head out to sea you know it's a mm. mediterranean river of things gonna dry up in the summer and it's gonna get lethally warm in most places uh, there's gonna yeah. be cold if the river gets slow enough and low enough there will be cold water pools but they'll be far and few between and not uh, a good strategy for a um smolt uh, an outgoing smolt or a pre-smolt that would stick around on the river for a while not a good strategy for them to try to exploit so they're they're responding to the change in the flow and the temperature and that's giving them you know the cues to turn into smolts and head out to sea um and they're growing while they're doing it because the water's getting warm um what uh we don't have a way to control the temperature that's coming out of the dam so um, some dams do. Um, no way. Shasta, Shasta Dam is a, a, a great example. There's a temperature control device. It's like a, it's like a big curtain that they can use to sl uh, selectively draw water oh, at different, water height, at different heights. Oh, yeah. Well, so it's cool. going to be warm at the top, and yeah. then there's going to be a thermocline, and then it's going to be cold. And that thermocline is, you know, depending on the time of year, you know, 40 to 70 feet deep, or depend, I guess depending on. Uh, you know weather conditions before that yeah. but they can 
draw water selectively and manage the temperature. And we can't do that on the Trinity. So when it's in the spring, when we have our release, it gets really cold really fast. It gets, it, it warms up a little. We're constrained to our release beginning in late April, around the, you know, the 20th or so of April, somewhere around the 20th. And, and uh, they, so they, um, the, the water starts to warm up actually before that. And the fish are, you know, getting in the mood to out migrate. And then all of a sudden they get hit with a big dose of cold water and well, it confuses them. them. Uh, <laughs> so they're not getting the, the cues that they would uh, normally receive wow, to out migrate. And some of the problems here, you probably heard the lower Klamath is in, uh, can be in pretty bad shape. Um, there's uh, oh, there's there's pathogens in there that infect young fish that sometimes kills them outright. Other other times just makes them weak. This past summer, right, was a really bad outbreak right. of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sea yeah. shasta, they call it. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and and so by holding them back in the uh, main stem trinity with that cold water because they, they it's cold and they're not sure if it's ready to head out. Um, if if if, they're, if they out-migrate late when the water in the lower Klamath is warm and those pathogens wow. are, you know, That's thick so and they, they get infected. So, yeah. um, so uh, uh, queuing those fish at the right time to out-migrate is becoming more and more of an uh, important thing for the program that we're, that we're trying to manage. And one way to do that it would be to um, use our that. 50% that we that we have use that earlier in the season mm -hmm. use it in the winter when those fish are like uh, are rearing giving them give them a floodplain to to go out and use like a natural river would provide them and um, and not hitting them hard with a with colder water temperatures at the time when they would normally be feeling warmer water temperatures yeah stuff so, so complex <laughs> it's amazing yeah For real. yeah yeah yeah. So, so yeah, that's that's uh, the logic for hitting them later with the cold water was just to wash them down. But then the temperature was an issue. Or? Yeah, that yeah. was so part of it was. Um, I mean, there were there were issues in how to manage this water volume. So it's we don't really know what the water year is going to be until sometime in April, right? Oh, wow. So <laughs> so it's really hard. It was hard to figure out how to manage that water volume until sometime in April. So part of it was just, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, maybe even longer when they were, when this was whole program was being envisioned, that was, you know, a pretty good compromise, um, was to wait until April. Um, also the assumption was that tributary floods would provide mm -hmm. some variability in the main stem and, and, uh, you know, time hasn't really borne that out. Um, the, um, and and it doesn't do anything about the real upper river yeah. that, uh, that's that's uh, above most of those tributaries. Right. So, uh, so part of it was just the application of um, you know doing the you know how to, how to manage this water volume. You got to wait till a little bit later in the year. And then there were ecological. Uh, there are ecological objectives, and and it was thought that yeah, I've given those. Uh, smolts a good push out to see would be helpful. So um, that was one aspect. Um, and then it was intended to mimic a snowmelt hydrograph. Like yeah. if you go back into the historical records of the Trinity River, you'll see winter floods, but also an, usually, most years a nice gentle uh, spring flood, and that's the mm -hmm. snowmelt runoff. So Actually, it was we meant don't want to, to think about what's the snowmelt, how that's being changed by like increasing temperature yeah and whatnot yeah like that right this yeah. is the first year in a while that we've had a decent snowpack in these mountains around here yeah i was gonna yeah. ask you like how yeah. exactly just the critically drought critical drought year we've had last year i was out here this summer and the lake is so so low oh yeah how last does that affect what y'all are doing um well it right now um luckily it, it hasn't affected it hasn't affected the Trinity River. It yeah. has the potential, though, and okay. and the potential is, it, this that lake was is, it hasn't really come up that much since it's uh, you know minimum last late fall. Mm -hmm. I mean, because most of the precipitations in the form of you know snow, hopefully, is snowpack, <laughs> and uh, and and of course they have been releasing water and, and all that. But um, 
it, it, at some point, the lake can become low so that uh, the intakes are above the thermocline. And if that in the fall, if that's in the fall when fall chinook are spawning, that could be real bad news for them if, if they're hit with really warm water, you know, right when they're spawning. <laughs> so mm. that's the that's the big worry, I guess, is is mm. uh, extreme droughts could take the river so low, or sorry, the lake so low that it's 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 having a the opposite. You know, we were talking about what cold water does to fish. Well, you know, too warm water, obviously. It, most people know are more aware of that being uh, hard on salmon, but that's that's the the risk there. So, um, yeah, we're seeing uh, that it, the the lake was the lowest though than um, since 1977, which is kind of the, this last year. Yeah, wow. it's the, that's the drought record for Northern California, mm-hmm. the the benchmark drought that all other you know droughts are judged against. 77. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, do you have an idea of um, where the dam is currently, mm-hmm. the salmon and steelhead, how far above that dam had they been spawning in the past before the dam didn't exist? Were they spawning below where the dam sure. currently is? Yeah, they were spawning below. There there were, you know, as they estimate there were 109 miles of um, anadromous fish habitat above the dams. Mm-hmm. So um, quite a bit. And, and um, right now, I mean, if you, there are like, you know, kokanee and, and good size um, rainbows from Trinity Lake that spawn up the East Fork and Coffee Creek and the main stem Trinity. So mm-hmm. there's still, there's quite a bit of habitat above the dam right now Yeah, um, that that's blocked. But also the, the uh, reaches that are inundated um, from what the pictures I've seen and the stories I've heard, they were just amazing. You know, where the Stewart Fork comes in to the main stem, yeah, um, nice and uh, a low gradient valley, lots of interesting and complex aquatic habitat, yeah, cold sure. water coming right out of the Trinity Alps. Yeah, and, sure. Um, so quite a bit, quite a bit. But there were still fish spawning below where the there dam were, currently is. Right. Yeah. There's a. Uh, was a study done in the late forties and early fifties when they were scoping this whole um, project. And and by the way, they they had concepts for dams pretty much all the way down the the Trinity no. and the Klamath. They they had an idea of putting a dam in it, like right there near just upstream of uh, the mouth of the Klamath. Um. Anyway, they they, they, yeah. did, fish, they did fish surveys to get a sense of you know what what was going on and and I, I think the concept all was all already in place to mitigate by putting a hatchery in at the base of the dam so they wanted to get an idea what what fish were there and how many and there's a I, I, I can put you point you towards it but there's a report um, I think it's it's referred to as Moffin Smith 1950 and they they sampled fish at Lewiston uh, they uh, I mean they had they had a uh, some kind of drift nets that they were catching out migrant out migrating smolts and they counted reds and they were up and down the river and they did document spawning below um, uh, the current dams Lewis and Trinity Dam and they documented mm-hmm. um, spring Chinook holding in a lot of places down below the dam as well gotcha so yeah there were definitely uh, fish using the main stem right mm-hmm. but now they're forced they're all the spawning effectively is taking place below that dam. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. Um, and do we have an idea of like what the carrying capacity is now or like how much it, how much it might've been reduced from what it was with the dam and without and to what extent can you increase that carrying capacity do you think by doing the yeah. channelization <laughs> work that you're talking about? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a big, a big topic that we're studying right now is yeah. What is the, uh, ultimate carrying capacity of the Trinity River, um, and you know it's not a, a known question. You know we have we have goals for all the uh, spring Chinook, fall Chinook, um, uh, coho, and steelhead. You know, we do have numbers that we're shooting for, but mm-hmm. they weren't actually those numbers weren't developed from a real rigorous scientific approach. Right. Um, so, uh, for example, sixty-two thousand fall Chinook wild fall chinook 
you know, escapement goal is is uh, what we're going for, and we haven't achieved that. And there's question to whether that is even realistic. Right. Um, What's but that now, sixty-two thousand is the goal, and where, where are we at now? Um, well, it, it varies a lot from year to year, yeah. but um, but a small fraction of that. Maybe, yeah. You know that now. This is this is so say ten thousand, right? But um, but that's escapement, and so those fish have already been subjected to harvest, mm-hmm. and which the Trinity River Restoration Program doesn't control that. That's done by the Pacific Fisheries Management Council, and those fish are caught in the ocean. They're, they're what does the escapement mean? Sorry. Oh, the, just fish that escape harvest, essentially the okay. ones that that return back to their spawning grounds. Okay. Um, untouched. I see. Yeah. So those are um, that's that's fall chinook, um, but. There's lesser um, numbers than our goals for the other other species, mm-hmm. but um, but yeah, it's it's almost like with with goals like that, then you just have to do all you can to <laughs> make as many fish as you can, and right. you know, really the but but we're um, back in the '80s and '90s, a lot of studies were done to look at or to find out why the, why the population was decreasing. The, and at some point in the 80s or 90s, uh, the, the salmon, um, Chinook salmon were literally on life support. They were being sustained by the hatchery, and then some of those fish would stray and spawn in the river. And they were, if it wasn't for the hatchery, they may, they may have just blinked out on the main stem. Oh. Um, uh, I mean, strays from other systems would have repopulated it, but there were, was very little... It was not considered a sustainable wild population, in, in other words. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, th- the studies that were done back then pointed to a lack of rearing habitat in uh, as what was holding the population back. And it was those studies were mainly focused on fall chinook, but it was just, the other species are similar enough. Although um, steelhead are more tributary spawners and, and so are coho, mm. but fall chinook are main stem fish, and so a lot of the emphasis was placed on that species. And so rearing habitat, physical rearing habitat, is essentially slow, shallow water. You know, it's mm. it's uh, um, slow, shallow water. I don't know, not not a whole lot. And and as I mentioned earlier, the river had downcut through all that sediment in in most places. That there was a U shaped channel or a rectangular channel, steep banks, and that slow, shallow habitat that would be found on a river that was hammered by a big flood and yeah. lowered those yeah. banks. Yeah, yeah that, that was lacking. So. And so so the idea and the central um, hypothesis of the program is that if we, from an adaptive management standpoint as well, if we if we address that limiting factor by increasing rearing habitat that that is holding back the uh, salmon populations that they'll return. Mm -hmm. Um, So we have increased rearing habitat. You know, we want, we, we want more and more. Um, And we are seeing an increase in um, out migrating salmon, Um, but we're not necessarily seeing the adults returning, Mm -hmm. um, and so that's pointing to other bottlenecks further downstream, either in the um, lower Klamath, we talked about disease, ocean conditions, um, which we didn't talk about, but that's a big driver of, of fish populations in the river. They have good years and bad years out there. Last couple of years, couple, three years have been pretty good, you know, um, but before that, they're, they call it the, the blob, the big warm water blob that sets up off the coast uh and that affects the distribution you know where uh salmon and steelhead are are living in the ocean it also affects the food that they're eating it affects the predators that that feed on them Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, we all need to start managing the ocean yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah right that's a tricky one (laughs) that's so interesting because i I, clearly i've been sort of thinking about this problem wrong i always thought the problem was you build the dams they can't get up up to the pea-sized gravel to actually build their spawning beds but you're saying that the limiting factor really isn't the availability of spawning beds no not on the trinity no it's it's spawning habitat has never been considered limiting right yeah -hmm. Yeah. interesting so it's more that once they hatch to become fries that's when they're having yep exactly that's their problem yeah 
So yeah, what, exactly. what's happening now? They just have nowhere to like live, or they're getting eaten, or they get washed down away. Like, what is what's so critical about well, the flood chan- the floodplains? They're they're. Uh, I mean, when you don't have sh- slow, shallow water for for fry to live in, um, they they're more vulnerable to predators. Yeah. They don't feed as well. Yeah. Um, it's like and a nursery. What's that? It's like a nursery. Right. It's yeah. like a nursery. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd say I'd say those those are the two main problems is that um, they don't have the right conditions to forage, and when they when they get out there, they're more vulnerable to predators, mm-hmm. uh, especially you know the fish that would live in, that live in deep water. You know, yeah. small fish live in shallow water. They can handle it well, not all the time. But so the the, the, the blob <laughs> that's out of your control, right? I mean, if that's oh. the, the the limiting factor, then there's nothing you can do about. How do you determine if it is sort of those oceanic conditions that's the limiting factor, or how do you determine if yeah. like you could do you could continue to do the best work in the world with channelization, creating that rearing habitat, but if the limiting factor this whole time yeah. is out in the ocean, yeah, what yeah, you're not really doing anything. Right. So how do you yeah. kind of figure? How do you figure out what the limiting factor yeah. is? In the, in well, the it looks like there's mo- there's there's multiple limiting factors at different you know at different times yeah um, and so the ocean isn't always maybe maybe it is a limiting factor some years but it's not in others mm-hmm. and and adramus fish populations are naturally um they naturally fluctuate they take especially chinook they take uh advantage of the good good years yeah. and then you know sometimes there's bad years but they have a uh, incredible reproductive rate when conditions are good they bounce back mm. um, another thing is is that it's uh, it's a big huge team effort in restoring an adrenous fish and you know we're we're uh, we can't do anything the Trinity River Restoration Program can't do anything about the ocean conditions right. but other people can and actually yeah. that's seems like it's more of a collective goal of humanity you know related to climate change and (laughs) making uh making that happen so um but um but the disease the disease issue in the lower klamath um we're hopeful that that will be addressed by removing the dams in the upper klamath um that are slated for removal um the issue there is that that uh, one of those disease um those pathogens uh, sea Shasta it has a life stage in a small annelid worm, and uh, they're susceptible to scour. But they, the, the the channel, the river up there doesn't scour that much. What scour? Is it? Just moving the river, moving okay. rocks. Yeah, yeah. and uh, they're so those those uh, worms are that are hosts for the or, uh, yeah hosts for the parasite. Um, they're susceptible to scour. The idea is removing the dams will increase. Scour um, yeah. and, more and help control, yeah, mm-hmm. or uh, more just more uh, natural floods with mm-hmm. that aren't dam mm-hmm. regulated, and yeah, and partly sediment increasing yeah. the sediment supply, yeah. So, um, so there are other players, huge, <laughs> you know, yeah, and it's a big job. I mean, we can do our part, we can, you know, work on the river and uh, and 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 just let other other people do their 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 part, right, yeah. Right. So, I want to be conscientious of your time, and I have to want to get yeah, back to your family for dinner. But I just maybe we can end by just like what is there one a few thing one thing that you're really excited about like in the next year or two yeah, years with the program I'm or like what's what's on the horizon? Here? Right. So I mentioned earlier temperature and and uh, flows, and you know you noticed the river was um, you know pretty low today. Yeah. Um, I didn't check the gauge to see what. Is I meant to do that? What is and coming clear. Can you milk it up a little bit for us? It's a little too clear. <laughs> yeah, right, right. A little bit of just, yeah, just put a yeah, a little, little bit of turbidity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's just some like white food coloring in there. Right. Like, green, <laughs> green maybe. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, no, no. Uh, but actually, um, naturalizing the hydrograph so that we do have variability, flow variability in the winter. That's that's the what, big. What is that? Naturalizing the hydrograph. So rivers aren't stable and low in mediterranean climates all oh. along yeah so we have a um we have a uh, system we we haven't been able to implement it yet um but uh for synchronizing um dam releases with tributary events mm-hmm. so that when the tributaries are, are flooding we can release water at the same time so and and this is a tool and a and a whole process that couldn't have been 
developed 20 years ago. It's based on weather forecasting and, and, cool. uh, and rapid response with dam operators to make it happen. Wow. And, and That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> so the dam would just be calibrated to basically do whatever the tributaries are doing in a way. So you maximize those high events, <laughs> right? Yeah. What's yeah. that again? So you're, you're taking advantage of the high, the high water created by the yep. influx and the tributaries, and you're timing that with the dam release to yeah. naturally, you yep. know, hopefully. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you would have a... You know, a synergy of the main stem and the, yeah. and the tributaries. You have, we would have a piggybacking, you know, tributary yeah. flows on a main stem flow, um, a, a more efficient export of sediment, um, a, a synchronization of the cues that fish, you know, yeah. respond to to move. You know, fish move on on flows. You know, right. that's, that's that's what they do. So, um, and then also um, inundating floodplains um, and uh, promoting. Um, benthic macroinvertebrate communities that form the basis of the, uh, the food web. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, so there's a lot of um, physical and uh, ecological aspects to, to this. Um, so so that's that's on the horizon. You know, that's something that we still have to, um, I, you know, needs to be worked out more from a policy and political level. But technically, you know, we're, we're ready to go. And... Uh, and and that would um, naturalizing those flows would logically improve the fishery. So that's what's on the horizon. Maybe next Very year, cool. maybe the year after. <laughs> but uh, if it results in more that. fish, you know, hey, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Great. That was... Yeah. <laughs> I learned a lot. What stood out to you? Oh, um, I was like, I guess I really didn't have like a very good idea of like what the limiting factor was or how complicated it was. I thought it was literally just like they didn't have anywhere to spawn because you spawn you dammed up their spawning grounds. Yeah. But that apparently is not really the problem from what I heard from him. The prob so the problem is that the It's the rearing grounds. Yeah. So they they get eaten by predators or they just get washed out too late. Or yeah. Or it's like too cold and they can't like go out and feed, you know, and get bigger. Mm -hmm. So that's what they're offer so it seems like the restoration program is targeting that particular limiting yeah, factor. Exactly. Even though there are uh, there are probably other limiting factors too. Yeah. Like uh, but, the blob. <laughs> like the blob, but and that's, it's just interesting, like, I, I guess I didn't realize the complexity of it. Yeah. 